Um, with that, um, I'm A.D. Filson, and I'm the Mobility Education Coordinator for the City of Cambridge um, in the Community Development Department. And this morning, we're joined by Galen from Mass Bike. Um, and we are so excited to be hosting this Healthy Aging Cycling Series um, as well. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Galen. Excellent. Thank you, Aidy, um, and thanks everyone for joining. Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, but I'll introduce myself and I'll introduce today as the start of a five week series. So my name is Galen. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Bicycle Coalition, also known as Mass Bike. We're the statewide advocacy organization. We're a nonprofit. We've been around since 1977, although I've only been at this role for about two years. So it's still a little fresh for me. But uh, I've been working in the city of Cambridge on bicycling education um, for the better part of the past 10 years um, for youths and adults. And I'm very excited to be working specifically with older adults so um, we can kind of expand our engagement and expand our content. Um, today's is a first of the series and actually the first time we're giving this presentation. So um, it's going to be a very high level um, touching on topics that we'll go into deeper later in the series. But today is going to be a little bit of an overview and it's going to be geared towards getting back on the bike. So today is cycling for older adults um, and it's just getting back on the bike. Future lessons uh, or topics we'll talk about, we'll talk about um, routes and bike lanes. We're going to touch on that a little bit today. Um, we'll talk deeper about some um, types of bicycles in future presentations, especially ones that are adaptive. So if anybody's interested in um, not just a bike with two wheels, but you're thinking a tricycle or other forms of self-propelled mobility or maybe even electric assist bicycles, we'll cover that a little bit today, but we'll go deeper in future topics. And um, we're hoping to have some special guests um, throughout the next month or so, um, potentially from the Healthy Aging Collaborative, um, potentially from AARP and a few others. So we're seeing what allies we can round up, but um, I'm proud to be here with you and I thank you for joining me this morning. Um, we'll start off by saying that I'm also grateful for the, the Community Development Department of the City of Cambridge. We do a lot of youth-oriented programming, so I'm very excited that we can expand our impact to also reach older adults. And like AD mentioned, um, we're hoping to have this coupled with on-bike rides so that this is a primer that one day, and arguably it's terrible weather today, so we wouldn't have wanted to ride anyway, but on the nicer weather days, that we'd actually be able to do group rides, um, socially distanced, physically separated, but um, yet in a way that you could meet each other and meet me and actually be introduced to parts of the city of Cambridge and beyond where you might feel encouraged to ride. Um, I'll start with this one photo here. This is Karen Jenkins. She's actually the board president of the League of American Bicyclists. So the League of American Bicyclists is actually the nationwide advocacy organization. And Karen, as board chair, has been able to take the league a little bit more in a direction that serves older adults. Now, we've heard time and time again that cycling, um, especially cycling advocacy, favors you know, younger, um, more wealthy, more white communities. So what I'm really appreciative of, of organizations like League of American Bicyclists here in collaboration with the City of Cambridge and Mass Bike is that we can expand our impact to reach folks who might otherwise be um, not necessarily part of the conversation. So my goal, though I'm presenting today, I want to encourage you all to feel um, part of the conversation and whether or not we can get the chat feature working today is besides the point we're going to have um, plenty of opportunities over the next four or five weeks for engagement. So thanks again for joining. Um, today we're going to talk again pretty high level. It's going to be about a 45 minute presentation or so with definitely room um, for Q&A. So at the end of the presentation or really at any point, feel free to unmute and jump on in. Um, just know that we are recording. So anything that you are saying um, and video wise will be recorded. You can turn off your video, you can turn off your mute, and you can always ask questions uh, via email or otherwise after the presentation as well. Um, we are here and available for you. Today's topics we're gonna cover, we're gonna do the benefits of bicycling to remind you how wonderful it is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the results of the 50 plus cycling survey, which was conducted by the AARP um, for folks 50 and up. 
and just some high level um, bullet points that um, help guide where I approach advocacy. We'll talk about bicycle types, different opportunities to think about what bikes are available. And again, high level, we'll dive deeper in a future presentation. We'll talk about where to ride, specifically around the city of Cambridge and ways to think about streets and pathways and bike lanes. And we'll talk a little bit about getting ready to ride. Today is supposed to be um, you know, dropping some seeds in your brain to say, oh, if I was gonna get back on my bike, what are some considerations to think about? And by no means am I the full-on expert. Um, this is just the primer that hopefully we can dive deeper in the course of the next month. But what I will say is that why is this important? Why are we spending so much time and energy on this? Well, though cycling is great for you personally, we're also trying to tackle some of the biggest systemic problems that we're facing, especially in the Commonwealth. We actually have some real existential dilemmas that we're battling which have only gotten worse over the years. Two of the big ones, um, one, we have the worst congestion, um, the most amount of traffic. It's a little hard to see during now because fewer people are driving into work, but on a normal day, if you're ever going around Memorial Drive, or if you're ever trying to walk across Broadway during rush hour, um, you know that it's a meat grinder out there. And what we're trying to do is combat single occupancy vehicle use. And I think in the older demographic, that's especially important so that folks feel like they have mobility options without getting into a car. And the second major battle we're trying to fight is the greenhouse gas emissions, which arguably is the overall existential crisis for humanity. And what we found in Massachusetts from a poll that's been conducted over the past 10 years is that the transportation sector is um, responsible for over 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions produced in Massachusetts. So we can take some simple actions to reduce car travel. We can make some dramatic decreases in greenhouse gas emissions, which I know we all certainly care about. Um, for future generations, we need to preserve our planet and making simple habit changes of just deciding not to drive whenever possible will actually go a long way into reducing that. And we're also gonna talk about the benefits of riding. So obviously the personal benefits, um, it's fun. Biking is probably the most enjoyable way, in my opinion, to get from point A to point B, because you can also visit point C, point D, point L, point K, and have a great time visiting it. Um, and then, you know, for the body, of course, as aging um, impacts um, the body functions, the regular exercise, the low impact nature of biking, um, and the increased physical activity is great for the body. It's also great for the mind. There have been study after study that shows that regular exercise increases the uh, hippocampus, increases brain blood flow, increases the productivity of the brain, and keeps the brain active. And there's something really cool about bicycling where you're engaged in a physical activity while at the same time you're taking in a lot of sensory input. And it kind of triggers the consciousness and the subconsciousness that work in real time um, when you're traveling on a course. So I like to say you're actually engaged in all of your senses all at once, um, especially your sense of balance and your sense of time, along with all your five senses. And it's a, a great boost to the brain. Um, freedom of movement is especially important um, for the aging community as um, driver's licenses um, and um, car storage and just general mobility of single occupancy vehicles becomes more challenging when one ages. We wanna maintain independence. We wanna maintain freedom. I wanna make sure that you can get where you want to get on your own power. So as you decide to give up your car, we're gonna to have to find other options for you to get around. And if that other option includes exercise, includes freedom of mobility and decreases car usage. That's generally a benefit for you and for everybody. Um, and one of the things that we're hoping to get to in this series is a group ride. So we're actually trying to combat isolation through bicycling. And one of the things that we found in the AARP study is that isolation along with physical challenges are one of the biggest issues that seniors and older adults are facing out there. So we're going to encourage that folks have bike buddies, have bike meetups. We do so in a safe way, we do so with masks, we do so with distancing. But if you could find a friend to go on a bike ride with, 
maybe somebody who's a little bit more experienced or maybe somebody who's a little bit less experienced. Um, you can actually go explore. You can have these adventures together. And that's a huge benefit for society because my goal is to make sure that people feel connected to their community and group bike rides are great. Um, I, you know, I left room open for what else. You can um, write down a what else. You can share it later if you like. I'm curious to know why you're here. So, um, you know, besides the fact of having a, a immediate interaction because I can't really see much besides my own screen. Um, if you wanna write down why you're here, what you're hoping to get out, what the benefit you are seeking, that will help gear where we decide to take the conversation over the next few months or next few weeks, I mean. Um, and also I can answer some questions and address some issues after the fact as during our Q&A. So please, please try to be interactive and we'll make some space for you once these slides are done. So. And just to, to hop in, it doesn't seem like we are able to get our chat function working for, um, for this workshop. That will uh, change for next workshop. I think you'll be able to um, request to be unmuted if you'd like to speak. Um, and also if you would like to email us um, after this with uh, the reasons why you're interested in this. And um, we can also address those in, in later workshops as well. I'm here with you for the long haul. We got four more of these. So we have plenty of time to get to know each other. Great. Thanks, Adie. Um, so I like to start most of my presentations, whether they're about fixing a flat or whether they're about riding in the winter, with three keys to bike riding success. Comfort, knowledge, and awareness. And this is just my overall framework, regardless of the topic, that I like to keep in mind as the guide points for where these presentations go. Comfort is the ultimate goal when riding. And comfort can be everything from the physical nature of riding. You wanna be comfortable out there, which means you want your bike to fit. Um, you wanna be riding in comfortable traffic. You might wanna be riding in comfortable weather, um, comfortable clothes. But I don't mean to say easy because biking should be strenuous if you want it to be. It could be a form of you know, strenuous exercise if you want it to be, or it could be like a cruiser if you want it to be, but comfort should be something, whatever level of comfort you want to ride at, that's the goal. Um, knowledge. Knowledge is where generally these presentations come in. Um, I like to throw a lot of information at you, so my apologies if there's going to be a lot, but the goal is to give you the knowledge which you can make choices to make your riding comfortable. And it could be letting you know about different types of bikes or different types of bike lanes, um, different types of opportunities. And this is something that I'm gaining every single day when I ride. I'm still, I've been doing these presentations for about a decade, but I still get more knowledge every single day when I ride. So I'm still learning. Um, so I'm also here to take some of the knowledge you wanna share. But again, these presentations are really in that knowledge bucket. And then awareness. This kind of goes to my general catch-all phrase. Um, this is like the, Biking is an all sensory experience. I think of it as a very Zen experience. Um, and by that, I mean, we're gonna have a lot of information that you're thinking about, but as you start to ride, this becomes habitual, this becomes subconscious. And so the awareness is key because it makes that connection between your brain and your body. And if you're not aware of what's going on, you might find yourself in a dangerous situation. And by awareness, I don't just mean visual awareness, or auditory awareness, but also be aware of your body. Um, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you tired? Do you need to take a break? Check in with yourself. Um, be aware if, you know, on, on, if you're inebriated, you're kind of cutting off some of that awareness. So don't ride drunk because you're cutting off awareness. Um, don't ride with headphones in because you're basically blocking one of the most important senses that you have, which is your ears to tell you what's coming from behind you. So ways of thinking about how can you make yourself more aware so that the knowledge that you're attaining from these workshops can lead to a comfortable bike ride. So these are my three frameworks that I like to think about. So keep those in mind as we jump around from topic to topic. A little bit about the study. So um, AARP did a great study over the course of the past six or eight months where they got thousands of participants from across the whole country saying what are some successes and what are some barriers to bicycling? How can we address that? So some key takeaways that I've found that I'm gonna bring up, and there's a bunch of them, but these are like the key four ones. 
Um, the first one is that older adults bicycle more often when they have someone to bike with. So again, the goal of this whole series is to go on group rides, which we'll get there at some point, you know, COVID willing, we'll be out there. But the idea of meeting up and being bike buddies, that's probably the best way to get out. Um, we've also realized that COVID-19 has motivated many older adults to start biking again. And what I found is not just older adults, we're actually seeing an uptick in all bike traffic. Even though people aren't biking to work, we're seeing a um, almost doubling of traffic on the bike trails, specifically the Minuteman bike trail, and even all the way out in Western Mass, if any of you have visited the Westfield um, Columbia River Greenway, which is beautiful. Um, it's up about 200% of the traffic of what it was last year. And we are seeing ridership increase, mainly because people are feeling isolated and they can't go indoors. So biking is actually a perfect way to get out, get exercise, keep your distance and have fun. And we're finding that is especially true in older adults as well. Um, we've also found that when we rated which bike infrastructure works the best in terms of bike lanes, older bicyclists want access to high quality and protected bike lanes. Now that is no surprise. We're finding that across the age brackets from eight to 80, or I like to say eight to 108, everybody should feel safe when they're riding a bike and protected from moving traffic. Now, this is something the city of Cambridge takes very seriously. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but the city council has accepted and passed an ordinance, which would require developers to build a protected bike lane network throughout the city of Cambridge um, with a timeline of about six years. So within about six years, we're going to have adjacent pathways. It'll be sidewalk, um, protected bike lane, travel lanes with parking lanes, separated, all totally separated. So you'll be able to travel throughout the city of Cambridge without fear of sharing space with traffic, if you do so choose. Now, we have bits and pieces of it. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit later in the presentation, but you've probably seen this in the city of Cambridge more and more. It's new. It's not everywhere, so they're still figuring out the connectivity, they're still figuring out the education and the enforcement around it. But what we found is on a survey is that more older adults would ride if there was a protected bike lane network. And the goal, of course, is to get more older adults riding. So therefore, we have to build a protected bike lane network. And uh, lastly, which I'll touch on a little bit today as well, but go deeper in future presentations, are electric assist bicycles. We found that e-bikes have actually um, basically allowed older adults to go further, to go farther, to go up hills, which otherwise would have prohibited riders. And, and folks with uh, mobility challenges or limited mobility are able to get over some of that mobility by having an electric assist bike. But these are different than scooters. These are different than uh, mopeds or smaller electric motorcycles because you actually still have to pedal. You actually still have to bicycle on an electric assist bike. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with e-bikes, I can dive a little bit deeper in future presentations, but I'm gonna encourage you to think about an e-bike as an opportunity that will really expand your mobility while still causing you to pedal and balance and steer just like you were on a bike. So you still get the physical benefits without necessarily the strain and challenges that come from having to ride a fully analog bike. Um, but these are the takeaways from the 50 plus cycling survey. Cool. Um, because today is geared towards getting back on the bike, I also wanted to throw a slide up here about physical challenges to keep in mind. The next slide I have is about bicycle types. But before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about some concerns. And this is something that I'm not a full on expert on, but these are some of the things that again came from the AARP study. Uh, this is something that I might actually recommend. If you have other suggestions for me to add to this slide, please write them down and send them to me so we can make this uh, more full. But keep in mind that if it's been a while since you've been on the bike, that um, you will need to take into consideration limited flexibility, which means you might want a bike that allows you to step over the frame more easily or has different balancing tactics. Maybe it's a three wheel as opposed to a two wheel. Just keep in mind that there's um, mobility issues in terms of flexibility, especially important if you're gonna be riding in traffic because the flexibility that's required to look behind you is something that you're gonna to need to get um, familiar with and practice for your muscle memory. And so 
just keep that in mind. Um, older adults have a um, expanded risk of injury when crashes. So things like bone density weaken at an older age. Um, um, it's not to go down the list of gamut. Everybody's got their own doctors that they're seeing. So, um, but just keep in mind that risk of injuries are um, greater at an older age and bones don't heal quite as quickly some, on some folks um, as folks age. Um, think about the shifting of balance. So when you're riding, there's a lot of center of gravity considerations. When we go out and ride together, um, we'll definitely spend a lot of time practicing the difference between steering with the handlebars versus leaning. And there's two different ways to think about turning your bike. And it becomes intuitive after a while, but if it's been a few years since you've ridden, there are things to keep in mind about shifting of balance. Um, you'll want to keep in mind the uh, limited vision. So as folks age, you lose a little bit of the peripheral vision. Um, what I will recommend is that, you know, you can actually develop your peripheral vision by doing exercises and even you can develop peripheral vision by biking because it forces you to see at the side. But we also know that the eyes age. And so there's considerations of, um, you know, having um, glasses and reading glasses and peripheral vision. And again, everybody's different, but it's just something to keep in mind. And there are ways to get around that. So we'll talk about some of the nuances that you can have on your bike such as a mirror, which may help with that. Um, hearing limitations, for those of you who are riding with hearing aids, make sure that they're set for the style of noises that you're gonna be hearing in traffic. So one of the things to keep in mind, just as a tip, and there are a million tips, but just one tip, is that you can hear before you see a vehicle that's coming from behind you. And usually it's a low tone, it's a low rumble that you're listening for. So if your hearing aids are set to listen to lower tones, that might be wiser if you're ever gonna be riding in traffic, just for instance. Um, simple things to consider based off physical limitations and physical challenges. Um, getting on and off the bike is also um, something to keep in mind because it's all well and good to balance when you're moving, but the hardest part about balancing is when you're at a stop. Because what happens when you stop, but your bike tips over. So you've got to be ready to catch yourself. You've got to be ready to step on and off the bike when you're not moving. Um, and again, when in, we're in person, I'll definitely help you run through the list of making sure that you're holding the brakes when you're getting on and off. And just like I would teach um, a, a young rider when they're just starting to ride, some of the things to be concerned with. Similarly to when you're getting older, just keep in mind that some folks might not think that, oh, getting on and off the bike is the trickiest part but it comes with the limited flexibility, comes with the balance that when you're at a stop, the bike tips over and you've got to be ready for that catching yourself. For those of you who are, uh, who've never stopped riding and are still riding, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. When you come to a red light, when you come to a full stop, you got to say, oh wait, I got to catch myself with my foot. So just keep those things in mind. Cool, I'll take a quick pause here, AD. Is there anything else to bring up? Um, I don't think so. I think the one thing we'd want to emphasize here is that even if you are experiencing some of these physical challenges, um, it might initially take a little bit to work on them, but um, many of these things can be overcome or there are adaptations or uh, solutions. So this is not in any way a discouragement, but um, just things to keep in mind and I think the great thing about biking is that um, it can help with a lot of these things, um, a lot of these physical challenges, and um, you will likely see a lot of improvement with the um, more that you do um, get on a bike. Great, yeah, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, this slide again, just to reinforce that, this is not meant to uh, scare anybody away. This is just a preliminary thought to, as we jump into some of the options of what's out there in terms of biking. So leads into my next slide about the different types of bikes. So keeping those limitations in mind or keeping your own interests in mind, why are you riding? What type of riding do you wanna do? Different types of riding will lead to different types of bikes. Now there's a million and one different type, types of bikes. It's a sliding scale. So you can find yourself anywhere on the spectrum, but just a few to bring up. Um, and they have different reasons for riding. So you'll have like, for instance, a commuting bike, which is a little bit more upright. Um, it forces the head to be a little higher up, which might be a little easier on the neck. 
Um, it allows you to kind of look around more. You're a slower bike. It's probably a heavier bike. It's a less efficient of a bike, but they're very common, especially around the city of Cambridge when you're only going a few miles. Um, maybe you're going to the store, or going to the park. A commuter bike is probably the preferred one because typically they're easy to get on and off. Typically, they have multiple gears, so you can make it easier or harder to pedal. Typically, uh, they have fenders, so if you're riding in the rain. Um, and then we have uh, what we see commonly, what we call the Cambridge crate, which is that milk crate, which is zip tied to the back of a lot of people's bikes for storage. Those work really well for commuter bikes because you're not really concerned about weight. You're not really concerned about efficiency. It's just trying to get from point A to point B and have fun. You can have a mountain bike which is a fatter tire bike. Um, and again, we'll go into a lot of these at the next presentation next week. I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the options that are out there. But mountain bikes are fatter tires. They're a little bit softer. Um, they're made for potholes. If you wanna ride off-road, which I highly recommend going and checking out the parks, and you wanna have a mountain bike or something that can go off-road, not every bike can go into the woods. Um, you'll wanna think, um, you know, what is my bike made for? What is the type of riding I want to do? Um, a road bike are typically thinner wheeled bikes that are higher pressure tires, which mean they go faster, there's less friction, um, they're lighter weight, but they're a little bit more, let's say designed for speed and designed for distance. So if you're concerned about going far or consider about going fast, maybe faster, a road bike might be something to think about, but it puts the body in kind of a downward position and that's kind of the the top middle image right there. A folding bike, which is kind of the middle um, center one, those are great. Folding bikes um, are great because you can bring them on the bus, you can bring them on the train, you can bring them indoors. Um, you can put them in the trunk of a car. So if you wanna drive or get a ride to a park, um, it's very easy to have a folding bike with you. You can just fold it up and they, they're about the size of a rolling suitcase generally. And there's a bunch of different types. Again, we'll go into it next week but it's just an option to think of multimodal. Those are great. Um, elect uh, we'll talk about recumbent bikes. That's kind of the bottom corner on the far bottom right. Those are when you're leaning back and your legs are in front of you, they're typically lower to the ground. Um, they're a little awkward if you're not familiar with them because they put your visual field low. So you're basically at the wheelbase of a lot of traffic. So it's just another consideration. But for folks who um, like the, um, the physicality of leaning back and having the legs forward. It's a very efficient way to ride. Typically they can be tricycles as well. We call them tadpoles because there's either like two wheels in the front and one in the back. It looks like a little tadpole when you're riding around. Um, but those are really great for older adults because you don't need to worry so much about balance and you don't need to worry so much about being high up off the ground if getting on and off the bike is a concern. Um, so recumbent bikes are also great, especially if you're on a bike path because you're not worried about traffic. Um, and then perhaps bike share. So you've seen the blue bikes, I'm sure, or the hubway bikes that are around the city of, Boston, of Cambridge and Boston and Everett and, and Brookline and elsewhere. Um, those are really heavy. Those are um, weighty. Um, they're designed for stability, not really efficient, <clears throat> but they're really good about going from point A to point B. So if you haven't tried them out, they're great as well just for balancing sake, but they are heavier. That's another thing to keep in mind. Um, and again, there isn't just one bike versus another bike. There's a sliding scale. So you can kind of choose where within the spectrum you want your bike to be. And lastly, though, I will bring up electric assist bikes. Um, these are game changers for a lot of folks who are getting back on the bike because they basically make <clears throat> any hill feel like you're riding on a flat. And what they do is they engage the motor when you're pedaling. So you still have to pedal the bike. You still have to ride the bike, but it's just a little bit of a boost for folks. Um, so it might help get started while you're getting into the proper gear. It might help you get over that hill, which is the reason why you're not riding because like, oh, I'll never bike over that hill. Yeah, I wouldn't either, but if I had an e-bike, I might. So there are ways of thinking about uh, modifying a bike, or I would say that any of these types of bikes could also be electric assist bikes because the technology is increasing so fast that what you're finding is that e-bikes really are becoming more and more popular. Um, we are working, I should make a caveat that um, the city of Cambridge treats these like bicycles for the most part. Most of the state treats these like bicycles. 
but we're still working on legislation that would define electric assist bicycles as their own distinct category. One of the uh, um, advocacy efforts that MassBike does is help write bicycling um, themed legislation. Right now, electric assist bicycles are in a bit of a gray area between bicycles and motorized bikes. Motorized bikes really are mopeds. They're governed by gasoline size engines and the law is written for mopeds and motorcycles and there is no law written for e-bikes. So what we're trying to do at Mass Bike is actually define electric assist bicycles as their own distinct category so that we can regulate them. Right now we're still in process because the state house takes a while to do their work, but just so you know, um, we're working on e-bikes so that they can have their own definition. But right now, don't worry about them for the most part. I'd say 99% of the state still treats them like regular bicycles. It's just something to keep in mind. If you are riding an e-bike, be mindful of where you're riding and make sure that there aren't any prohibitions on electric assist bicycles. For instance, if you're riding in the woods, some um, parks don't allow e-bikes. So just keep that in mind if you are thinking about riding an e-bike. Just want to throw that out there. And again, jury's out. We're still working on the law. It's going to take it's going to take a while to get a law passed, um, but we are working pretty darn hard on it. Great. Um, with that, I'll take a quick pause. AD, is there anything else that I should mention on bikes? Great. Um, I don't think so, yeah. Let's jump into basic equipment. All right, so you've chosen the bike, and the bike you've chosen is based off the needs that you have and the desires of biking that you want. You need to get the basic equipment. Let's talk some basic equipment. Every bike, Regardless of the style of bike that you're riding, you should have a helmet. Not gonna go into the reasons why helmets are so important, but just remember that they fit properly and they could also fit improperly. So know that your helmet is a good size. Also, helmets wear out over time. They dry out, the styrofoam cracks. I say if your helmet is over, older than five years old, get a new helmet. And I might say, oh, well, I got a helmet from the 90s. It looks fine. It's not fine. You don't want to mess around. Um, styrofoam does degrade over time. Plastic does degrade over time. It's worth it to go to a bike shop and try on a bunch of different sizes and styles to see what fits. And I know the city of Cambridge can help you if you can't make it to a bike shop um, or would like to get a free helmet, talk to Mass Bike, talk to the city of Cambridge. We have ways of hooking you up. But just so you know, get a helmet and wear it every time. Hopefully you'll never need it, but you should always have it because you never ever know when you might crash. And if you were my sixth graders, I'd go into a lot of talk about how many brains do you have? Does your brain grow back if you're damaged? I'd talk about how gooey and gross your brain is and how hard your skull is. I'm not gonna go into all that with you, but you're older, wiser. Um, hopefully you're protecting your brain. You've made it this far. Let's make sure that your brain stays nice and sharp and that no injuries occur. Um, because one big hit could be the difference. Um, some other basic stuff you should have. Um, I recommend lights, definitely for riding in the dark, but I'd also recommend lights for riding in the day. Um, lights and high-vis clothing definitely go a long way in letting drivers know that you are out there. And one of the keys to riding success, and we'll talk about this in future presentations, but is riding predictably. Letting folks know where you are and where you will go is absolutely key to make sure that you don't have conflicts out there on the roads and pathways. One of the best ways to do that is having lights, and it's actually the legal requirement at night. You need a white light in the front and a red light in the back. It's just basic laws of traffic. You know this, but it's a reminder that please, please get a light. Um, same like helmets, um, if you don't have one, we can get you a light. Everybody here should have a set of bike lights when they're riding. I also recommend getting a strong bike lock. I recommend the big heavy steel ones if you're able to carry it, but a simple cable lock will go um, probably enough if you're only locking up for a short period of time. If you're riding to the store, riding to the coffee shop, or just riding to the park and you need to lock up, um, getting a good lock, but making sure that you know where to lock your bike to. So find a bike rack and how to lock your bike. So my demonstration here, my little image in the middle of the screen, um, this is kind of the A model of locking where you're locking the wheel 
the frame of the bike and the back wheel, and there's even the secondary lock that makes sure that that back wheel doesn't get stolen. Um, bike theft is fairly common in Cambridge. I wouldn't say it's like a major pen, uh, major epidemic like um, in New York City, if you leave your bike out for 10 minutes, your wheel will get stolen. It's not that bad, but if you leave your bike overnight or if you leave your bike outside regularly, um, you do run the risk of a thief who eyeballs your bike and then um, could take the opportunity to steal it. Um, my rule is just make sure your bike is locked better than the bike next to yours because thieves are generally thieves of opportunity and they're gonna go for the lowest of the hanging of fruit um, although if you had a really fancy bike out there, you might want to go the extra mile and make sure that you locked it up. Um, you could go as far to do both wheels um, and the frame, but at least, at least make sure the frame is locked. And please, please lock to a bike rack, not a bus stop sign, not a handicap access sign, not a fire exit, nothing that will block people on the sidewalk. The reason that bike racks exist where they do is because the city has taken the due diligence to cite them, to go with landlords, to go with the DPW and say, okay, a bike here will not block traffic, will not block handicap access, will not block people with mobility challenges, will not block um, you know, strollers and people walking dogs because we are all sharing the same public space. So please, please, wherever you are locking up, make sure it's a, an official bike rack. And you'll see some official bike racks actually in parking spaces these days on the side of the road. City of Cambridge has done a really good job of putting a good amount of bike parking out there because we realize that one of the deficiencies out there is if you don't have a place to put your bike at your destination, you're less likely to ride. So one of the goals of the city is to make as much bike parking as possible so that you are encouraged to ride so that you can lock up when you get to where you're going. You might think about mirrors. You might think about sunglasses. Again, these are a kind of a personal issue, but um, for folks who um, might have uh, challenges turning and seeing with peripheral vision, a mirror is a good secondary source. You can get a mirror on your helmet. You can get a mirror on your bike itself. Now, mirrors do have blind spots, so you're going to want to check as much as you can with your with your vision. But mirrors go a long way in helping out that. Um, that muscle strain. Um, and sunglasses are great, especially in the glare that's out there. Again, everybody's got different eyes, but keep in mind that sunglasses go a long way, especially when you're riding. Um, if there is danger of a bug in the eye or a small piece of gravel that gets kicked up, if you're ever riding off-road, I recommend sunglasses as a protecting. Or if sunglasses, you don't want sunglasses, that's fine too. You can get clear glasses, but something to protect your eyes goes a long way. You can also get gloves, but you know, uh, a mark on the hand is a less of a danger than a bug in the eye or um, a, a small piece of debris in the eye. So something to keep in mind are cycling glasses as well. And then lastly, because we're in COVID times and beyond, you might want to think about having a face cover. Um, you could go so far as getting a full N95 mask. Some people do. Just keep in mind that, you know, the condensation and the breathing might be a little more challenged so you might want to ride a little bit slower it be ride a little bit easier um, these face covers i have here photographed that's me and my buff just a little mass bike buff just to cover the nose and the mouth um, it's good because it protects you but then also common courtesy you want to make sure that you're not carrying and transmitting um, covid19 to anybody else whom you see out there common basic practice um, I needed to go a little bit deeper. We were having this conversation in March, but I'm pretty sure we're all on the same page at this point in October. If you're ever outdoors, if you're ever interacting with anybody else, you're gonna wanna have a face cover. Cool, but this is the basic, basic equipment. There's a lot more we could talk about in terms of water bottles, um, in terms of bike bells, um, in terms of bags to carry, which we'll dive deeper into future presentations. But this is a taste of what to know that once you have the bike, you're also going to need to get the basic equipment. Cool. So you got the bike, you got the equipment, you're going to need to maintain your bike. So one of the things that people definitely slack on is checking their ABCs. Now ABCs, if we were my sixth graders, I would say, what does ABC stand for? And you'd all say air, brakes, and chain. It's a fairly easy check that I'll teach you when we all get on bike, but the basics are squeeze your tires. 
Do you have enough air? Can't ride your bike if you have a flat tire. Squeeze your brakes. Rock your bike back and forth. Do your brakes lock up your wheels? Are you able to do an emergency stop if you need to? Do you feel comfortable that your brakes are strong enough to stop your bike? If your brakes are weak, you need to check them. And it might mean that you adjust them. So the image here is adjusting the barrel adjuster, which we'll go into when we're on bike, about how to tighten or loosen your own cables. Every bike's got them somewhere. Sometimes they're by the handlebars, sometimes they're by the brakes themselves, but I'll show you where they are. Um, you also wanna check the brake pads, and then you also wanna check the brake alignment to make sure that it's stopping the wheels. But there's a lot of varieties, and if you're unfamiliar, you might wanna have your bike checked out at a bike shop. Um, bike shops are fully functional right now. You can bring your bike over to any of the number of bike shops in Cambridge or beyond to get your brakes checked. Um, it's absolutely crucial. I think the most important part about biking is being able to stop. So make sure you can test your brakes before you ride. And then the chain. The chain I like to think is the go of the bike. It's where the force of your pedaling and the momentum and all of that power comes from. If your chain is dirty, your chain is rusty, um, you're not gonna have an efficient ride. You might not be able to shift gears easily. Um, you might be slower because your chain is gunky um, and there's a lot of friction going on. And if your chain looks like the chain down here, that's bad. That's actually gonna wear away your chain and it's gonna cause your chain potentially to break on you. And it's, I've actually broken a chain while riding and it's not fun. You have to walk home. Um, so getting in the habit of cleaning and lubricating your chain regularly. And by regularly, I mean maybe once every month or two, or if you're riding in the winter, which is possible, maybe you know at the end of a ride, you just wipe down your chain keep that rust away. Um, and we can go into these in depth, but the ABCs, again, is air, brakes, and chain. And it's something that you're gonna be responsible for knowing how to do on your own. Anything more than that, you can bring to a bike shop. If you need to replace your tires, a bike shop can help you. If you need to replace your brakes or get them fully adjusted, a bike shop can help you. If you really need to go through and adjust your chain tensions um, or how your shifting works or to get a new chain, a bike shop can help you but you should know how to pump your tires, you should know how to check your brakes, and you should know how to clean and regularly lubricate your chain. It's just basic maintenance. And actually, it's pretty fun once you get into it because it gives you something to do, and I guarantee you, you're gonna feel it immediately. Once you put some air in the tires, you're gonna have a lot more fun when you're riding out there because you'll go faster, you'll be able to go farther with less uh, challenge, um, you'll be able to stop quicker, and you'll be able to shift gears much more easily. It just feels better when the machine is working in your favor. Cool, but and just for some considerations. Yeah, jump in, Amy, thanks. I hop in there. Um, I do periodically host mechanics workshops um, throughout the year. Um, so if you're interested in any uh, more in-depth mechanics workshops, you can sign up uh, for the our bike workshops newsletter that's um, cambridgema.gov slash bike workshops and we'll post the schedule and, and email out um, when we are hosting those. Cool, and I highly recommend them too. AD is a great instructor and there's a lot of varieties of bicycles and AD knows them all. So, great. Um, cool. So you've got your bike, you've got your gear, your bike is in good condition. How do you start to think about getting back on the bike? So. Just some basic tips. And again, you might have some more to share with me, so I encourage some feedback. But you wanna start slow. You wanna start very basic if it's been a couple of years. You wanna build up the skills and that um, it's gonna take a little bit of planning. Um, don't expect that you're just gonna jump to riding to the store if it's been 10, 15, or more years. What you're gonna to wanna to do is basically find yourself a nice, safe, protected area, free of traffic, and I would recommend, you know, first getting on and off the bike, holding the brakes, make sure the bike doesn't roll anywhere, tilt the bike over, step over it, get on the bike, get off the bike, get on the bike, get off the bike. Do that, honestly, for five minutes and just build up that muscle memory so you get familiar with it. Second, find yourself a nice protected space free from traffic like a parking lot. Um, 
or a park or maybe Memorial Drive when it's closed on Sundays, somewhere where you can get to that is free from distractions and dangers. That's gonna be very important so you can focus on yourself, your body, and your machine. Again, this is a lot of knowledge that you're gonna be attaining, which hopefully becomes subconscious, but it only becomes subconscious once you start to do it regularly. So think about maybe for the first, you know, who knows, five or six times you're riding, you're not gonna go anywhere except loops in a parking lot, and that's totally fine. You're gonna to wanna to get familiar with your braking, get familiar with your shifting, get familiar with getting on and off the bike, and just start with the basics. I guarantee you, even if you're riding in a parking lot, it's still gonna be fun. And when we are together and doing our bike drills, I'll teach you some of the on-bike drills about how to practice your bike skills just in a parking lot. You can actually have a lot of fun building your own little course, um, but start, start slow. Um, once you get comfortable with that, I recommend finding places that are free from traffic. So find the off-street pathways. Cambridge is great this way. For those of you who live in West Cambridge, the pathway around Alewife um, and the pathway around Fresh Pond is an awesome pathway. It is gorgeous. It's flat. It's safe. Um, people aren't going fast, mostly joggers and dog walkers. Um, and it's gravel, so you're not even so much worried about the pavement side of things. So you're forced to go slowly. Um, that's a great little pathway. On the weekends, while they're still closing Memorial Drive by Charles River, by Harvard Square, all the way to Western Avenue, is also a great place to practice because you have a lot of space and you have a long distance. Um, it's also a wonderful place to people watch. Um, you know, if you're out in East Cambridge, you can be on the pathway system along the Charles River or over by North Point Park. There's a lot of pathways that are by North Point Park, by the Education First facility and the Museum of Science, which actually we call them traffic garden. They're made to look like a street. So you're actually kind of building up your mental palette of riding um, in a streetscape, but find the places that are comfortable to you. And again, don't need to jump into traffic. You don't need to ride in the streets to start. Just start slow, start where your comfort level is at. And then once you're ready, I would say start with short trips. Get familiar with riding to the store, riding to the grocery store, the coffee shop, the pharmacy, finding where the bike racks are. To then you'll start to think about the tips and tricks about, oh, if I'm gonna make this a real part of my daily life, how am I gonna get over some of the barriers about, um, you know, this intersection is terrible, maybe I'm gonna avoid it. Or this bike rack is really great. I'm going to make sure I park my bike there, even though it's an extra block to walk to where I'm going. You're going to find these little trips um, and these little tricks to make your trips happier. But by starting with short trips, it just makes life a little bit easier. And then you can kind of grow your distance and grow your length. But again, main tips is start slow, start easy. And just to hop in there, um, remember that you especially if you start with short trips, you don't have to bike both ways. Um, you can walk your bike there and bike back or vice versa if you just want to um, get a little more comfortable with the route. Um, also, I think something that we see is that, um, you know, this isn't always about like physical ability. A lot of it can be just confidence, um, being comfortable and confident on the bike. Um, I think a lot of times, if people are really nervous, you're actually way more likely to uh, take a tumble. And so a lot of this is just making sure, that, you know, even if you're physically able, um, building up that confidence and, and um, um, yeah. Cool, excellent, thanks Eddie. Cool. Once you've got the confidence, once you've got the muscle memory down, once you've got the bike, the bike's in good condition, you got your helmet, your lights, I know there's lots of steps here, um, you're gonna wanna think about your route. So I'm, I'm gonna fly through these because I'm actually gonna dive deeper in the next presentation about routes in Cambridge, but just some things to keep in mind. Um, the main one is consult the bike map, but don't be held to it. You can find your own route. You can find the cut through in the cul-de-sac or the nice little park that you might not have seen on a map and explore on a bike. So feel free to go find your own course. I also recommend finding a bike buddy. So um, maybe in the future when we can get everyone kind of in a more meeting setting, 
I might encourage us to take a few minutes, maybe at the beginning of the next webinar, we could do that if folks can introduce each other. Let, um, let us know where you're calling in from. Let us know if you're already riding or if you're starting or if you're just interested and what type of riding you might do. And we might be able to set up a little match and you might be able to meet up and share tips. Maybe you're not going on a ride yet, but you can at least lean on each other. Um, I've got a few tips to share in this presentation, but I guarantee you that there is a lot more knowledge amongst our participants than we have in this presentation. So I'm gonna encourage us to find bike buddies because you're gonna find that friend, um, that coworker, that person who is volunteering with you, who knows your route, who knows the way to get around that tricky intersection. And that's the best way to kind of really get over some of the barriers from somebody with experience. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about routing. Um, the city of Cambridge does a fairly good job with their bicycle facilities. Again, we're in the process of building out a separated bike lane network, which is gonna take five to 10 years, so give it time. But what we have right now is basically a smattering of different types of infrastructure throughout the whole city. Not gonna belabor the point here. We're gonna dive deeper in future presentations, but just so you know, there is a bike map that the Cambridge Community Development Department puts out um, this one is a little bit outdated. It's about three years old. So there's a lot more bike lanes that have popped up since this has been done in 2017. But you should also know the city of Cambridge has a bike map, a bike plan, which they're currently rewriting. And um, we'll send some information about how to chime into that bike plan afterwards, because we are taking public input on it to know where to guide the next five to 10 years on the city of Cambridge. But if you can think about where you are on this map, this might be a really nice and handy resource to say, oh, I live right near this pathway. I never knew that connection existed. So just something to keep in mind. And we'll share these slides afterwards. So if you wanna see this bike map, um, you, can, you can take your time with it. Um, one thing about the bike map is that there's definitely different types of bike lanes. Um, your route may encounter all of these different types of bike lanes on the streets. Um, we'll go into them more deeply in a future presentation, but for the interest of time, suffice to say that they all offer different varieties of protection from moving traffic to varying degrees. Some have you riding in traffic, sharing a lane. Some have you next to major traffic, but there's no barriers. So cars and um, trucks and buses can still merge into the bike space. Um, some bike lanes have a physical protection. Sometimes it's a parking lane, that's the physical protection, or a flexible bollard, that's the physical protection. But just so you know, um, there are some options with physical protections, and then some are actually built totally separate on the curb, more sidewalk level. And again, it's a sliding scale, so you might have a bike lane that's somewhere in the middle of that, somewhere um, we're also seeing some more intersection treatments we're seeing some bus shared bike infrastructure um, but flying through um, the city of cambridge you're going to find that you're going to be on a sharo and then all of a sudden you'll be in a bike lane and then all of a sudden you'll be in a protected lane mainly because the bike lane network is still in process and then once you leave the city of cambridge it all depends on what the local municipality has built and i would say that cambridge is kind of farther along than some of our neighbors but just so you know that there are different varieties of bike lanes out there. Um, and what it's based off of essentially is the level of comfort that you get riding in the city based off the streets. So this is actually an analysis of all of the streets in the city based off how comfortable people feel. And of course, this is very subjective and it changes depending on the weather, maybe depending on the traffic, maybe depending on the time of day, but generally, we see a lot of oranges, a lot of yellows, and some reds, which are arguably kind of the more dangerous roads. So if I isolate out in my analysis, just the low stress, high comfort levels, um, uh, yeah, what you find is you get bits and pieces of high comfort bike lanes. So what I'm gonna say is that your ride, if you're going from point A to point B, might encounter some higher stress areas. So what I would encourage us to think about are planning routes that incorporate the physically separated infrastructure with the lower stress, which may mean avoiding some of the higher traffic roads. And one slide I like to bring up is the crash map. Now, each of these dots, 
and I'll, I'll orient us in a second. Each of these dots is a crash that has been reported by Cambridge police or that was responded to by the EMT that involved a bicyclist. Now, it didn't necessarily involve a driver of a car, but definitely a bicyclist had a crash. What I want us to focus on are, this is kind of the central square to Harvard Square area. Just as an example, what you'll see is that around Broadway, around Hampshire, around Mass Ave, there's a cluster of crashes. Now, these crashes are from 2014, um, I think, to 2019. So it's five years worth of data. So it's, you know, a lot of data. Crashes are not very common, but I just want to show you that there are roads that have fewer crashes because there's less traffic. And what I want you to think about is Harvard Street, which might be a little hard to see here, but it basically splits the middle between Broadway and Mass Ave. You have Harvard Street, which conveniently is between city halls, which conveniently also goes past a couple of bike shops, which conveniently also goes from the business district of Harvard Square to Central Square. But it is a way to avoid Mass Ave and a way to avoid Broadway. You can find a quieter street. So this is what I want you to think about. Once you're comfortable riding, once you're comfortable with your mechanics, once you're comfortable with your mobility, when you are choosing your route, it does not need to be Mass Ave. Even though Mass Ave has a bike lane, it's not comfortable. It doesn't need to be Broadway. Even though Broadway at some points have bike lanes on certain blocks, you do not have to ride on Broadway. You can find quieter roadways that kind of split the difference and that's what I want you to start to think about. Where in your neighborhood might you be able to avoid some of the worst traffic and find some of the quieter streets, which may be safer. And it may require you riding on infrastructure like the Shero, which is more shared, but if traffic is slower, if there aren't any buses, if there aren't any delivery vehicles, you might actually have a safer time riding in the neighborhoods than you would on something that has a bike just for reference point. Um, and to keep in mind that there are fully separated facilities. Now this map is actually again outdated. Um, once the updated map comes up, you'll see that we are connecting the existing bike network for the off street pathways, which hopefully will get um, more riders out there on all ages, especially older adults. Cool. Um, oh, and I'll leave this map up for a second. This is not just the physically separated roads um, with bike lanes, but this is also the ones that are considered low stress. And you'll see that it has a lot of neighborhood roads in it. Um, for instance, those of you familiar with Mass Ave in Central Square, I recommend riding on Green Street or even Bishop Allen before I would recommend riding on Mass Ave just based off traffic. I don't know, AD, is there anything else to jump into about infrastructure and the city um, before I wrap up? Um, I don't think so. Cool. I think we'll, we'll be going over more infrastructure in a, in a later workshop, so uh, more to come. Excellent. Great. So just, um, oh, uh, one more slide I forgot to throw in here. I just threw this one in here. This is an example of a ride that the city of Cambridge hosts. It's called the bow tie ride because it looks like a bow tie. This is one of the group rides that in a normal year we would have hosted that would have had a couple hundred riders um, we would have closed down some streets. We would have police escorts. The city would have been there. I would have been there. It would have been a great time. You would have seen riders from all ages. Um, it's not really happening in COVID year, but hopefully this is something to look forward to where we're going to have a great group ride. And of course, this is on city roads, so maybe this is not a route that you would do on your own. But this is an example of a great, awesome, fun ride that tours the city, that gets you to know your own neighborhood, and do so in a safe and um, protected manner as a big group um, for the bow tie ride. I just wanted to make a pitch for the great work that the city of Cambridge is doing. And I have, uh, if we all hope that 2021 is better than 2020, maybe I'll see you out there next spring when we do our bow tie ride um, and we'll see how that goes. But just something to keep in mind that I really appreciate this ride because it gets a great tour of the city. And again, it's cute because it makes you think of a bow tie, which, a lot of people think the city of Cambridge, the map looks like a bow tie. So that's where that comes from. Cool. Um, my last tip for you is whenever you are out on the roads, 
or the pathways, or really any time that you are riding, you need to think about yourself as driving a vehicle. Now, when you're riding a bike, for the rules and regulations, for the state laws, every law that applies to a vehicle, for the most part, also applies to a person on a bike, which means what do you do at stoplights? You stop. What do you do at stop signs? You stop. What do all vehicles need to have on at night? Lights. What color lights do all vehicles need to have on in the front? White. What color do all vehicles need to have on at the back? Red. Um, who has the right of way in a crosswalk? The pedestrian. These are examples of things that I want to remind us, and hopefully we want to remind all cyclists, because yes, we see people running red lights, and we see people doing bad behavior out there, and that's something we need to combat and we can combat that with education, but we basically need to remind that when you are out there, you need to obey all traffic laws, not just for the sake of everybody else, but for the sake of yourself. It is the safest way to ride. You have to be predictable when you're out there. The best way to be predictable is obeying the traffic laws. Um, we can dive deeper in a future presentation about some of the ways to avoid some of the crashes that you see out there, and again, the best way to do it is by being predictable and by obeying all the laws. But that said, even though I just talked about running red lights and I talked about the scariness of some traffic, I want us to remember that biking is fun, biking is healthy, biking is the most sustainable way and the most efficient way to get from point A to point B. And I love this uh, line from Albert Einstein, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And I think that's especially important for older adults, for folks who feel like they aren't able to get out as much into the world like they used to. A bicycle could be that vehicle, could be that tool that gets um, folks who really need to get out there. Um, if we can do so safely, if we can encourage it, if we can get out there together, then we're going to have a much better time. So with that, um, I'll totally open this up for questions and comments. I appreciate that you took your hour with me. Um, and Aidy, feel free to jump in with anything to add. And then to let you know that next week, we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the bike infrastructure. We'll talk a little bit more about bike um, considerations, about if you're gonna make it a daily ride in the city of Cambridge. Um, going into future weeks, we'll talk a little bit about some considerations of adaptive cycling, We'll talk about some nutrition aspects, and um, I'm also interested to cater the future presentations off of your needs, so please, please get in touch with us. We have both of our emails here, and um, if you've got any tips for us that you want us to share, or any questions that you want us to address, um, we have a course of the next month to cover it, so I appreciate your attendance, and I'm looking forward to working with you for the rest of the series. Um, and, um, and please do feel free to email either Galen or myself with any questions, any feedback, any topics that you would like covered uh, more in depth. Mm -hmm. um, and I will follow up with some, um, with an email with some of this information. Um, and also I can, Galen, if you send me your slideshow, I can um, distribute that as well. Cool. So, yeah. yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Galen for joining us and we hope to see you all next week.